Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, then thanks for joining. My name's Sarah, I'm a doctor in the UK and I make videos about my life as a doctor and what I get up to outside of work. So today we're doing something I haven't done in a while. We're doing a Q and A. I got sent this question on YouTube. Hey, I recently graduated medical school. I have all the things you mentioned, especially the imposter syndrome. I already forgot most of the things I learned in medical school and there is no way I can have a real patient, make a diagnosis, etc. How did you overcome it? I'm too scared to work. So I started writing an answer to this question and as I was writing the answer, more and more was coming out and I was just like, God, this is gonna be the longest reply ever. And I started to think that actually maybe more people would benefit if I made a dedicated video answering this question. So here you go. First of all, I would like to say congratulations on becoming a doctor. You've passed medical school and this is huge. I'm sure that this is a moment that you've been thinking of for many years and I would just like to say congratulations, it's amazing, well done you. I hope that the excitement and achievement of passing medical school and actually becoming a doctor hasn't been too, crowd, too clouded by this kind of fear that you've got going on about starting work. Here's a photo of me looking very excited to graduate from medical school. So yeah, I would agree with you. Moving on to the next stage is always going to be scary, but I would suggest to you to think about the things that you gain rather than focusing on all of the things that could go wrong. So for me, when I was finishing medical school and starting work as a doctor, I kept thinking about the fact that I would no longer have to study for imminent exams and that I would gain all of that free time by not having to revise all the time. So yes, you're working long hours, but outside of work, pretty much all your time is free. The other things you gain, think about your salary, you're gonna start earning some money after years of living as a student. That for me was huge as well. You get to make new friends, new colleagues, you know, making a good group of friends with your F1 colleagues, that was a really nice experience for me. And also the pride. I'm sure that you have friends and family who are so proud of you and you should be so proud of yourself for becoming a doctor. It's really a fantastic achievement. So I can't stress that enough. Well done to you. So other than that, I'm going to I'm going to separate this video into three main parts. So the mental and the psychological things that you need to address um, in answer to this question, the actual physical things that you can do, and then answering your point about I forgot most of the things that I knew from medical school already. So we're gonna start with the psychological things to try and help you address this issue. And I'd like you to try and remember that everyone knows you are junior. Everyone knows that it's your first year as a doctor. And I'm saying this from a point of, um, from my own personal experience. So when I started work as a doctor, as an F1, I felt like I had to know everything. You've come from medical school where they teach you that you need to know everything, it needs to be spot on, you need to ace your exams. There's kind of like no leeway. When you're a doctor and you actually start again from scratch, everyone knows that you are the bottom rung. And I'm not saying that to be mean, but I had this kind of overwhelming fear that all the nurses are going to expect me to know everything, the consultants will grill me, they're going to want me to know everything. Um, because I, I think I had that left over from medical school that, that everything had to be perfect. Um, but you're no longer a final year medical student having to pass those exams. You are the bottom rung of the doctors, you are the most junior person. The other senior staff are there going to, that are going to be looking out for you and making sure that things are okay. You know, the nurses are on your side, they're going to be helping you you don't need to know everything so please bear that in mind because that was something that bogged me down for many months as an F1 and I think as soon as I realised that and actually kind of got that into my head my F1 year improved dramatically and I started to have a much better time. Secondly if you aren't working yet and you're just enjoying a bit of summer before you actually start work as a doctor if you've got all this free time why don't you spend a bit of time reading some materials on confidence building I wish I had done this before F1. As I finished medical school, I felt like I was on top of the world. It was like a huge achievement. You might have seen one of my previous videos where I talked about failing one of my final exams at medical school. I knew I hadn't done well. I opened my email and it said that I'd failed. That was a massive, you know, massive blow to my confidence. 
then I finally passed it on the second try and got through medical school it was like this huge high I was so proud of myself for graduating but I think the fact that I failed that final OSCE had really knocked me and knocked my confidence and I did feel like I had something to prove and I wonder if you're going through something similar and I personally wish I'd I had done some work on my confidence building so I'm going to suggest a few books and resources that you could use to try and bolster your confidence before you start on the wards and hopefully those the psychological tips and tricks that are given in those books and resources will help you. So the first book I'm going to recommend is The Courage to Be Disliked. Now this is hands down one of the best books I have ever read and if you take away one thing from this video it would be to read or to listen to this book. The Courage to be Disliked is all about stoic philosophy and the premise of working towards things as a team, towards a greater goal rather than everything being about your ego and your self-esteem and how people think of you. It introduces the concept of all of us being on a horizontal plane rather than a vertical hierarchy. So rather than thinking of your boss or your seniors as above you, thinking of everyone on a vertical plane and that we're all learning and working together. I really would recommend this book and I will link it down below. I will also link an Audible link if you're not already signed up to Audible. Um, on that link you'll get a 30 day free trial and one free book so you could download this as your free book. I read this book a chapter a day so that each day I could just take in and mull over each bit of learning from that chapter. Once I'd finished reading it I felt so much happier and confident at work and I really wish that I'd read it during my first year as a doctor. The next book I'd recommend is The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. This is another absolute game changer and I'm sure this will really help you. The final book I would recommend is Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. You may have heard of her from the TED talk that she did about shame and this book dives deep into aspects of shame and why we behave out of fear. Now this might not seem relevant but when you actually read the book you will realise that there, it has so much to do with confidence and self-esteem and that doing the right thing and acting bravely in your day-to-day -day life can have a huge impact on your confidence, your self-esteem and can really take away any thoughts of imposter syndrome that you you might be experiencing. And thirdly, in terms of psychological things, I want you to remember every doctor has to go through this year. Every single person that you meet on the wards, however senior that they are, has been through this period of time where they are brand new and they don't really know what the hell's going on. You don't need to compare yourself to those people who are so high up in their career. You need to just be good at the things that you are meant to be doing. Just remember that even if you are working with very senior people, top professors, things like that, they they have been through with this. You are looking at them at the peak of their career um, and I'm sure that any senior doctor you can speak to has got many stories of blunders they made as a junior doctor. Okay so now I'm going to give you some practical tips that you can actually use to hopefully make your F1 year a little bit easier and smoother and I wish that I had done, I did some of these things and also I wish that I had done others of them. So first of all be prepared on the wards. I was very prepared on the wards and this was something that I did to help me with my own anxieties. Something I worried about when I was on call, when you're doing really long shifts, you know, sometimes you're in for 13 hours straight and you're on your feet that whole time, busy, busy, busy. Um, I worried about, am I gonna get hungry? Am I gonna get dehydrated? Making sure that I had enough food and snacks and water with me and coffee meant that I, that took kind of one anxiety away from me. So get yourself a nice big water bottle, get yourself a thermos flask so that you've always got some caffeine with you, get yourself some Tupperware, make yourself some decent nutritious meals, prepare your meals in advance, take them with you. That way you won't get completely stuck if, for example, you're working an on-call, you're absolutely desperately hungry, you haven't had a break for eight hours straight, you go to the cafe, lo and behold it's shut, the only thing you can get your hands on is a Mars bar from the vending machine. Not ideal. So make sure that you are prepared with things like that, that that will help you. Also things like, um, I found that taking lots of pens with me, um, making, you know, making sure you've got your name badge, your stethoscope, those kind of things. I know this sounds really simple, but these, these are the things that make your day run a bit smoother. The other thing I did, I'll go and get it now because this is a little tip that I don't think I've seen anywhere else. So I bought myself this. 
and you could probably buy something similar online. I hang this on my door handle and I would put in all the things I needed to take with me to work. So I would hang my stethoscope from here, um, pens, hand cream, chewing gum, uh, name badge, so that they're all in one place by the door and then I can grab I can grab them out of here as I leave for work. So secondly, if you know the jobs that you're gonna be working, which I presume you do, then try and read up on the condition specific things that you are likely to see on that job and that will really help you with your confidence and your diagnosis. I wouldn't say that's something that you need to be doing now. Enjoy your summer, enjoy your break, maybe just a week or a few days before you start work, start reading about those conditions just to kind of remind you it is all still in your head. And also when you see conditions on the ward that you aren't really that sure about, you're not that clued up on, maybe it's something you haven't seen before or um, something that kind of rings a bell from medical school but you don't really know exactly what it is, just jot it down and then when you get home, you can look it up for 10 minutes. Then next time you see it, you will be a bit more clued up. On that note, the Oxford Clinical Medical Books are really good. They're pocket sized. I mean, I don't know who has pockets that big, but they are pocket sized. They're very easy to chuck in your bag and take with you on call. When you are clerking patients, you can use that as a guide to look up certain conditions and get an idea for a management plan. As well as that, use the guidelines at your hospital. They will have specific guidelines for how to deal with certain things, but the Oxford the Oxford book is a bit more of a general overview and will be very useful for you practically. So those are a couple of good tools for you. Also, going back to remembering that you are the most junior in the team, please ask for help. Three most important words in this whole video, ask for help. Don't be too proud and don't think you have to know it all. Don't think you have to prove something to everyone. Please, if you're struggling, ask for help ask ring your seniors you hope you will have a registrar on call with you or even a consultant if things get really hairy they might not be physically with you but they will always be at the end of the phone even if they get angry with you or they are obstructive please just remember that the main focus of your job is making sure the patient's safe if you need help and you don't know how to deal with a patient call for help ask your seniors. Um, they would always rather that you asked and then didn't need them and they maybe think you're a bit stupid, that's happened to me many times, then you kind of trying to struggle along on your own, not really being sure what's going on and then you get yourself into such a pickle that the patient starts deteriorating and then you really need help and then they've got a lot more to deal with. We, we are working in a team and um, you know, it's we're all working together to help get patients better and have a good experience. Final point in this section, take your breaks. For goodness sake, take your breaks. Eat on your breaks, hydrate. Don't sit there reading medical stuff. Don't, if you're gonna sit with your colleagues, try not to sit and chat about medical stuff. Please just switch your brain off, read your book, listen to a podcast, go for a walk, listen to music, chat to your mum on the phone, anything other than work, just, take your break you need it <laughs> it's not optional um, and at the end of your shift hand over write a list of jobs um, try and be as thorough as you can hand to the person you're handing over to but you don't need to be a martyr and try and stay late all the time the the idea is that handover is there so that you can get away and someone else takes that baton for the patients final section in this video i thought this was going to be like a quick q a like a five minute quick fire round but you can see why this uh, reply to this comment was getting really long because i have so much to say on this topic um so the bit the way you say about i already forgot most of the things i learned at medical school well i would say that's okay. When you're studying for your medical school finals, it's kind of a bit of a peak in your knowledge. You are trying to prove that you have studied and learned as much as you possibly can. Of course, some of those details are gonna slowly become less important in your brain, and that's okay. That is all right. I'm sure that there's many, many things that more senior doctors learnt in their careers and have slowly forgotten because they're not using them all the time. F1 is going to be a sharp learning curve. Um, you will pick up things on the job that you need to learn, you need to know for that year that you didn't even know that you needed to know. And they're not even necessarily medical stuff. It's where things are kept, how the computer systems work, how certain processes work within the hospital. It might be a bit frustrating to you to think about all of the medical knowledge that you that you've forgotten from your medical school finals, but that's okay. F1 isn't about um, isn't about proving all of that stuff. Later down the line, if you apply to specialty training, 
you will start learning again, doing exams and things and revising and your knowledge will slowly start to pick up again. Um, so that's okay, it's the natural progression of being a doctor. At the moment, just focus on being a good F1. One of my friends, Lauren Jane, has a YouTube channel as well and she has an amazing Instagram account. And one of the things that she says a lot on her channel is focus on being the best at the things that you're expected to do. So even if you feel like it's a bit of a menial task, if you're expected to take bloods or cannulate patients, even if you feel like that's not really something that's gonna help you that much in the long term, it is it's really useful to be really good at the things that are expected of you and you have you will build a certain pride in your job by practicing those things and getting good at the tasks that you are expected to do at that level there's plenty of time to progress and learn more exciting and intense things um, but just becoming really good at the things that are expected of you makes you have a bit of job satisfaction at the end of the day the other thing that I would suggest that you focus on in this year is getting to know your colleagues, spending time with your team. If there's out, you know, if there's socials outside of work, then go to them, meet your colleagues, make friends with them, um, learn the nurses' names and chat to them, ask them how their day's going. Try and enjoy the team environment and making new friends with your colleagues. It will make your, your day and your week and your year as an F1 go so much better if you're on good terms with all of your colleagues. I hope that this video has helped you and I hope that it's helped many of you in fact because I know that a lot of you are kind of in this position at the moment where you're, you're prepping for F1 and for those of you who started work in February um, after the finals during the corona out for, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic I just want to say massive hats off to you guys I can't imagine what it's like starting work during a pandemic so I just want to say thank you for all your hard work you guys are great give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it and I will catch you in my next one bye this week's shout out goes to recess medicine thank you for your comment and good luck starting f1